Welcome to Searching for Italy podcast. I'm your host, Timothy Eady. This podcast will discuss every facet of Italian and Italian-American culture, language, traditions, and food. Join me on this journey through the Italian-American experience. Welcome to the Christmas episode of Searching for Italy podcast. We'll uncover some Italian Christmas traditions and Christmas history in Italy. Let's start. Christmas is one of my favorite holidays. I love Christmas because it's a very international holiday. Many people of different backgrounds celebrate it without any religious significance. Our modern celebrations have roots that go back many hundreds, if not thousands of years in Europe and the Middle East. Let's first talk about the origins of Christmas and maybe uh, the first types of celebrations happened around the winter solstice. So around the December 21st, but let's, let's talk about what the Romans used to celebrate. They had a festival called Saturnalia, which was held on their winter solstice, which was actually December 25th. How did the Romans celebrate Saturnalia? It was a pagan celebration of Saturn, the Roman god of agriculture in time. It began as a single day, but by the late Republic, it had expanded to a week-long festival beginning December 17th. Um, during Saturnalia, work and business came to a halt. Schools and courts were closed and the normal social patterns were suspended. People would decorate their homes with wreaths and other greenery. And the most interesting aspect was uh, the slaves or the lower classes didn't have to work during Saturnalia, but were allowed to participate in the festivities. In some cases, they sat at the head of the table while their masters served them. Instead of working, Romans spent Saturnalia gambling and singing, playing music and feasting, socializing, and giving each other gifts. Wax taper candles called cere or kere were common gifts during Saturnalia to signify light returning after the solstice. Well, on the last day of Saturnalia celebrations, known as the Sigillaria, many Romans gave their friends and loved ones small terracotta figurines, known as Signilaria, which may have referred back to older celebrations involving human sacrifice. So Saturnalia was probably by far the happiest Roman holiday. The Roman poet Catulus famously described it as the best of times. So this holiday was pretty riotous. It, people used to celebrate with a lot of drinking. And sometimes they were so loud that once the Roman author Pliny reportedly built a soundproof room so that he could work during the raucous celebration. The god Saturn is also similar to the god Kronos in Greek mythology. And there's many connections with Saturn and Father Time. And many depictions of Saturn are him wielding a, a harvesting scythe, pretty much like the Grim Reaper. And probably in the story Dickens Christmas Carol, he, he's probably the ghost of Christmas future or the ghost of things yet to come. And in part of the mythology and where Saturn got part of his name was that he was sated with years. The story is that he regularly devoured his own children. It's also explained by the fact that time devours the courses of the seasons and gorged itself insatiably. Saturn was thus enchained by Jupiter to ensure that his circuits did not get out, out of control and to constrain him with the bonds of the stars. Therefore, in Saturnalia, the festival was about his liberation. So the cult statue of Saturn in the temple traditionally had woolen bonds tied around his feet. But during Saturnalia, these bonds were loosened to symbolize the god's liberation. In many Roman households, they would choose a mock king the Saturnalicus Pinceps, or leader of Saturnalia, sometimes also referred to as the Lord of Misrule, usually a lowlier member of the household. This figure was responsible for making mischief during the celebrations, insulting guests, wearing crazy clothing, chasing women and girls, etc., etc. This idea was that he ruled over chaos rather than the normal Roman order. The common holiday custom of hiding coins or other small objects and cakes is one of the many dating back to Saturnalia, as this was a method of choosing the mock king. So how did Saturnalia lead to Christmas? Thanks to the Roman Empire's conquests in Britain and in the rest of Europe, 
from the 2nd century BC to the 4th century AD, many of Western culture's traditions derive from this period. The Bible does not give a date for the birth of Jesus. In fact, some theologians have concluded he was probably born in spring, as suggested by references to shepherds and sheep in the Nativity story. But by the 4th century AD, Western Christian churches settled on celebrating Christmas on December 25th, which had allowed them to incorporate the holiday with Saturnalia and other popular pagan midwinter traditions. December 25th was also known as the Dies Natalis Solis Invicti. So this was the birth of the sun. The god Sol played an important part in the pantheon, but it actually played more of an important role after the or during the reign of Emperor Aurelian, um, after the crisis of the empire and reunification. So the cult of Sol Invictus became one of the most important and more front and center in the Roman world, especially in the Western Empire. Um, and also coinciding and very much connected to Sol Invictus is the cult of Mithras, or also known as Mithra, which was a, a cult that was very popular with Romans, but especially men, and specifically soldiers. It was brought from the east from Persia, through Anatolia in Greece, to Rome during the height of the empire. It was kind of like a secret society, with feasting and secret ceremonies usually held in caves under temples, or in caves in general. Throughout the Western Empire are the ruins of these temples. It is argued that it was the main competition to Christianity. The birth of Mithras was held on the 25th of December to coincide to the Dies Natale Solis Invicti. So now let's talk about one of the most famous and important figures in Christmas tradition around the world. Of course, I'm talking about is Santa Claus. In Italy, they refer to him as Babbo Natale. So who is Santa Claus? Or San Nicola? Or in English, Saint Nicholas? Well, Saint Nicholas lived between the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. He was born in modern-day Turkey, but not much is known about his childhood. Then he moved to Mira, and he was ordained a priest and later elected a bishop following the death of the metropolitan bishop. Under Diocletian, he suffered persecutions against Christians, but the Edict of Milan by Constantine restored him the freedom to profess his creed. Nicholas's life ended on the 6th of December in the year 343. So, as often happens, the life of the saint intertwines his history and myth. But St. Nicholas went down in history as a man of immense goodness, always ready to help the poor and unfortunate. Also for this reason, one of the most famous moments taken from tradition concerns the miraculous help that he offered to three sisters who had fallen into disgrace. These girls were the daughters of a fallen nobleman who, following unfortunate events, found himself in total poverty. St. Nicholas, to prevent the three sisters from ending up on the road to prostitute themselves, took a large sum of money, wrapped it in three bundles, and for three consecutive nights threw each bundle in the house of the unfortunate family. In this way, all three daughters had the dowry to be able to marry. Then there's the story of the gift of the three apples. It is then said that on a similar occasion, Nicholas gave three apples to as many children so poor that they did not have anything to eat. The next morning, those three apples had turned into precious golden apples. So similar episodes fueled the tradition that depicts the saint today as a friend of the poor and of the children to whom he often and willingly brings gifts. The most famous feast of St. Nicholas in Italy is obviously that of Bari, where the saint is venerated as patron saint and his relics rest in the basilica dedicated to him. In the Apulian capital, the first celebrations and masses begin already on the night between the 5th and the, and the 6th of December. Then, on the afternoon of the 6th, a long procession carries the statue of the saint through the city. There's music and dances and shows uh, that continue until the evening. So, in the rest of the world, they celebrate various versions of Saint Nicholas. Over time, through many other competing mythologies and traditions, also on the ideas of uh, Catholicism versus Protestantism, some of these versions would change and alternate between gift giver or a kind of semi-scary figure to somebody who flies around on reindeer. But many of these myths go back to 
European traditions uh, from many, many centuries ago, probably pre-Christian, and derived probably from Celtic, Germanic, and various other traditions in Europe. Another figure in Italy that is quite famous, that is probably unknown to most Americans, but is very famous in other countries, especially in Sweden, is the feast day of Santa Lucia. The feast of Saint Lucy is on the day of the 13th of December. Throughout the country, Italians celebrate La Festa della Santa Lucia, or the feast of Saint Lucy, annually on the 13th of December. While Santa Lucia is most popular in Scandinavia, she was born, lived, and died a martyr in Sicily. Therefore, special devotions for her take place up and down the peninsula, specifically in the north, but also in her home region of Sicily. Lucia was the patron saint of the blind. Lucia was persecuted for her faith around 300 AD, making her one of the earliest recorded Christian martyrs. Various legends narrate that she would wear a candlelit wreath as she carried food and aid to Christians hiding in catacombs. According to this traditional story, the saintly virgin refused to marry a powerful pagan man who fell in love with her legendary eyes. Raging from rejection, he sent soldiers to blind her. Her eyes were miraculously restored. In another version, she plucked them out herself and sent them to her suitor on a platter. Roman authorities then ordered Lucia to work in a brothel, but she refused to go, as not even a fire set under her feet could get her to budge. One of her persecutors ultimately killed her by stabbing her in the throat with a sword. So Lucia, she's the patron saint of the city Syracuse, or City Cusa in Sicilia. Uh, in fact, she gained greater fame in Syracuse uh, when the Great Sicilian Famine of 1582 ended on her feast day thanks to the ship loaded with wheat that entered the harbor. Rather than processing the wheat into flour, the starving people simply boiled it and ate it. Now, Sicilians honor her memory by abstaining from anything that is made of wheat flour on December 13th. Traditionally, they eat whole grains, which usually takes the form of cuchilla, a dessert of boiled wheat berries sweetened with ricotta and honey. So the celebrations uh, of Santa Lucia Typically on this day, Italians gather together and burn candles and torches and enjoy an abundance of food and drink. However, traditional celebrations of Santa Lucia vary according to region. In northern Italy, specifically in Trentino, Alto Adige, Lombardia, the Veneto, Friuli, Venezia, uh, and Emilia Romagna, Santa Lucia is celebrated similarly to the St. Nicholas tradition. But instead of traveling on a sleigh, she rides on a donkey. And visits homes on the eve of her feast day, bearing gifts for the good children. And rather than milk and cookies, families leave out coffee and cake, sometimes uh, biscuits and oranges too. However, the children cannot watch her visit, where she will throw ashes in their eyes. In Milan in particular, you will see uh, Santa Lucia represented in the cathedral, as she is considered the protector of the sculptors of the Veranda Fabrica del Duomo, who process marble every day continuously at risk of being hit in the eyes by splinters or blinded by the dust. Now let's talk about probably the most interesting for me and unusual from an American perspective is the figure La Bifana. La Bifana is a, an Italian folklore. Uh, she's a witch who brings good children treats on the morning of the Epiphany, which is the 6th of January. But if you are bad, you wake up with a lump of coal, so very much like Santa Claus. In Italy, the Epiphany marks the official end of the Christmas season, commemorating the day when the three wise men arrived at the manger bearing gifts. Every year, the occasion is celebrated with living nativity scenes, a great procession through the city center, and probably most exciting for the children is the arrival of the Bifana. According to the story, the four figures' fates were intertwined when the Magi happened upon the Bifana early on during their quest. She hosted them for an evening in her humble but cozy cottage. The next morning, they invited her to accompany them to Bethlehem. Busy cleaning her home, the Bafana declined at first. But then, after they carried on their way, she had second thoughts. She quickly filled a basket with gifts for the baby Jesus and set off alone. Although she followed the same star, she was unable to find the manger before the wise men did on the 6th of January, the Epiphany. So... Today, the Bafana continues to travel the world on the eve of the Epiphany, 
searching every house for the child and leaving candies and chocolates for good children and just coal for the bad in her wake. Interestingly, interestingly, the etymology of the Bifana is probably how the Romans tried to translate the Greek word epiphany to epiphania. Or possibly it could be from the Roman or Sabine goddess Strenia, where also the archaic word for a gift is called Astrena. The Bifana and many of these other characters like St. Nicholas and even possibly Santa Lucia might have connections again to pagan mythology and folklore. Another day that is very popular among Italians but is probably unknown to most Americans is La Festa di Santo Stefano. Uh, it's the, the day after Christmas, so on the 26th. In the Commonwealth countries like Canada or the UK, they celebrate Boxing Day. But in Italy, the Festival of Saint Stefano is a day where you go out, you meet friends, you go into the piazza, and you usually visit nativities. So let's talk about more interesting Christmas traditions in Italy. So in America, we have a kind of long drawn out celebration, usually ending after Halloween and continuing through Thanksgiving up until Christmas. And then a kind of slow decline into New Year's and after New Year's, everyone's finished. They've had their two months of Christmas music and food and people have had enough. But in Italy, they tend not to decorate or think about Christmas until the 8th of December, which is called the Immacolata. Um, that's when people can put up their Christmas trees or their Christmas nativities. So if you were to travel through Italy during the Christmas season, the towns and the cities are completely decorated. Piazzas have Christmas trees. Businesses and shops are completely decorated with garland, with wreaths and lights. It's very festive atmosphere, but some places really are incredible. So, for example, in the Vatican, they do a gigantic Christmas tree in St. Peter's Square. And actually, uh, in another town called Gubbio, which is in the region of Umbria, they have the biggest Christmas tree in the world. Technically, it's not a tree. Let me explain. So, since 1981, there's been a tradition of lighting up the side of the hill on the slopes of Monte Ingino. The lights start from the ancient walls of the village of Gubbio, and they go all the way up to the mountaintop. While the star is at the top, where the Basilica of Sant'Ubaldo, the patron saint of Gubbio, is located. From the base of 450 meters and a height of probably 750 meters, the Christmas tree of Gubbio has also entered the Guinness Book of Records as the largest Christmas tree in the world. The lighting takes place every year on the 7th of December. Let's talk about another incredible Christmas tradition of the nativity scene. Now, in America, our nativity scenes generally are in city squares. They're usually fairly small. And most people's homes, if they have a nativity at home, it's the manger, um, and some people call them Christmas cribs. But in general, they are small with the animals, uh, the three wise men, or the three kings. You have Jesus and Mary and Joseph, you know, the shepherds, angels, not, not much more out of this group of characters. Well, in Italy, it's completely done in a, in a very theatrical way. It's incredible. But first, let's go into the history of the modern nativity scene. So the modern nativity scene uh, was actually started by St. Francis of Assisi. The story goes, it was started in the small town of Greccio. In the year 1220, St. Francis had made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to visit the places of the birth of Jesus Christ, and was so impressed by Bethlehem that returning to Italy, he asked Pope Honorius III to be allowed to leave the convent of Greccio to stage the representation of the nativity. The first nativity scene in history was set up near the wood near the town in a cave. Francis took the manger with the straw into a cave and brought an ox and a donkey there. So in doing this, the saint was able to tell the story of the nativity to people who could not read so that they could know the story of the birth of Jesus. Starting from Greccio, the nativity scene thus became a popular tradition that spread throughout central Italy. During the 15th century, the nativity scene reached the city of Naples, and following decades, especially following the invitation that Pope Paul III addressed to the faithful through the Council of Trent, it also won a place in noble houses, in the form of an ornament or in the guise of a chapel in miniature. It wasn't really until the 18th century 
that the Neapolitan crib became popular. The crib art spread to the homes of most distinguished families in the cities, especially in Naples. The nativity scene reached original and highly sought after expressive levels, becoming kind of a source of pride for the families who competed to have the most sumptuous nativity scene. For this purpose, the nobles spared no expense and commissioned impressive works from their trusted sculptors, making with increasingly precious materials and dedicated entire rooms of their residences to the cribs to show off during receptions and private parties. It was in this period that the Fair of Santa Lucia was established in Bologna, an annual market which, still today, attracts thousands of fans from all over the world, where the statuettes made by local artisans were exhibited. Ironically, the nativity scene, born as a means of communication with the population, entered public housing only after having found a place in churches and noble residences. In fact, during the 18th and 19th centuries, the tradition of the nativity scene gained the central place in the homes of ordinary people that it still occupies today in the Christmas holidays. Today, thanks to technology, the traditional nativity scene has been enriched with new features, lights, streams, and flowing water, and above all, with new materials. Many of Italy's scenes are made with traditional materials like terracotta, wood, plaster, and paper mache and other people simply just buy them. But if you ever go to Italy, the best place to visit for these presepi is in Naples. So there is a street in Naples called uh, La Via San Gregorio Armeno. It's the most famous place where they produce and sell handcrafted figures and scenes. It's a definite must-see if you visit Naples. Another tradition in Italy is the Presepi Viventi, which is all over Italy, in villages and cities from Matera all the way up to the north of Italy. They have live nativity scenes, where they have animals to reenact exactly what St. Francis first started. Coming to Italy during the Christmas season, one of the most peculiar things you might come across are the Christmas bagpipes that the shepherds play in many villages and cities. This is called the Zampugnaro or Zampugnari. These are the Italian bagpipes. They originate from central southern Italy in the provinces of Molise and Campania. Um, they're traditionally farmers. Uh, during the Christmas season, they would move from the countryside and play their Christmas songs in the piazzas of the villages in return for food or money. But they became so famous over time that these bagpipers are now like a quintessential aspect of the Christmas season. If you didn't think bagpipes were even affiliated with Italy, think again. These are very much a part of Italian culture, and they are very, very much a part of the Christmas traditions in Italy. Also, if you visit Italy, there is something that is probably pretty common throughout all of Europe. I'm not so sure if there are many places in America that have these. In my hometown of Syracuse in New York, we had really nothing like this, but Christmas markets. Christmas markets are really a part of most of European countries, but it originates from Germany. But in Italy, they have their own Christmas markets that are quite interesting. And typically in a Christmas market, they have a square or a piazza filled with many beautiful things. So food and decorations and lights and it's, it's a market. <laughs> so uh, some of the best markets, if you ever come, are traditionally in the north of Italy. But there are also some more interesting markets in the center of Italy. So I'll name a few of the more impressive ones. The Christmas market in Milan, in Piazza Castello, Santa Maria Maggiore in Piemonte. Also, they have very beautiful Christmas markets. So generally, you would see them in the South Tyro, near the Alps, also in Aosta, in Trentino Alto Adige, but also in Naples or in Rome or Florence. You can find these very, very beautiful markets. Probably the most interesting out of these for me is the market in Marche, the Italian region Marche, called the Candelera. They have festivities that take place, the town's candle-making past, which is why it's called Candelera. Each evening, the streetlights are turned off, and thousands of candles illuminate the medieval town. Aside from all the candles, there's a fully functioning Christmas market with a living nativity scene also. Another festival that I like to mention is from where my family comes from, in Molise, where they have an ancient Christmas festival called the No Chiata. So on the evening of December 24th, the No Chiata of Agnone is a parade of a great number of noce, or torches. These torches are huge, with great fires on them. And these people parade through the streets with these torches. And then after, they usually bring it into a big pile and make pallets of it. So it's like a giant bonfire. 
And it's quite, honestly, it's probably one of the most inspiring visual that you'll ever see. Okay, let's talk about food. One of the most famous food traditions of Northern Italy is zampone and cotechino, which is more or less the same thing, uh, I think. <laughs> The zampone, which means like an, a leg of an animal, uh, in, re in reality, this is a leg of a pig. It's traditionally served on lentils, so it's probably one of the most typical dishes in the north of Italy. For most Americans, it might not be so appetizing, but I've never personally tried it, but it looks actually, for me, it looks interesting. So yeah, it's, a, it's pork. It's a leg of a pig. Other Christmas traditions that's probably the most famous in all of Italian food traditions. It is panettone and pandoro. When I grew up, panettone was fairly common. You could find it at the supermarkets. Especially now, it's very, very popular. Pandoro, maybe not so much, um, but maybe you could find it in other parts of the country. But in Italy, pandoro, which means bread of gold, was originally started, it was originally started in Verona, while it was made by specific families. And eventually they would start to produce pandoro it became a very traditional dessert to eat during Christmas time. Also, the other is panettone, which is a type of bread uh, with fruits and nuts inside of it. And for me, this is one of my, my favorite things to eat. This originally comes from Milan. Several legends exist about the birth of panettone. Some people mention the story of Ughetto dei Atelani, a boy who fell in love with a girl, Adalgisa. In order to be near Adalgisa, Ughetto pretended to be a pastry chef, so he could work in Adalgisa's family bakery. While there, the love-struck young man tried to invent a new cake by mixing flour, eggs, butter, sugar, and, and sultanas. Ugetto's creation was a smash hit, earning him favor with Adalgisa's father and paving the way for the two to be married. So another legend is based on the story of a cook working for Ludovico il Moro, who had to prepare a Christmas lunch. After baking the cake, Cook forgot it in the oven and it burned. A boy named Tony, a kitchen porter working with the cook, suggested a solution. Cooking another cake with a leftover ingredient, which were flour, butter, eggs, citron peel, and raisins. When the cake was served, everybody liked it, and the Duke wanted to know the name of the cake, which was called Pan del Tony, Tony's bread, which then evolved into the name Panettone. I don't know. Anyways, these are very, very popular in Italy during the Christmas season. In Naples, they're famous for what is called struffoli. It's a typical suite of the Neapolitan region. They're basically small, soft balls of sweet dough that are fried, then soaked in honey, and finally garnished with colored sprinkles. So these are extremely famous in Campania during Christmas. Another dish typically served in Campania, but probably more served on Christmas Day, and then the day after Christmas on Santo Stefano, is called the Minestra Maritata. This is a, a type of soup that is mixed with various ingredients. So in the soup, they mix pork rind, pork ribs, celery and carrots, they mix sausage, onions, pig foot, can't forget the pig foot, escarole, chicory, black cabbage, of course, they add Parmigiano Reggiano, salt, they mix it together, and this is like una bomba. It's like a super heavy, sits in your stomach food, but super delicious. And this is typically eaten in Naples or in Campania. So this leads me to what do Italian Americans celebrate that is similar to Christmas traditions in Italy? Now, if you ask any Italian American, they have this tradition called the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Well, this is very curious for me because I grew up in an Italian family, but we, were, we didn't really eat this, this meal on Christmas Eve but almost, almost everybody I knew grew up with this tradition. What is the, f the Feast of the Seven Fishes? Well, doing a little digging, this is not something most Italians know about. This is actually something that is probably more familiar with Italian Americans. So where does it come from? Well, most people think it's because it's a Roman Catholic feast day. So the Feast of the Seven Fishes um, might sound like a very typical Catholic holiday, but it really has nothing to do with gorging yourself with a lot of food. So it probably doesn't come, at least the name doesn't come from a Roman Catholic tradition. Usually in the Catholic liturgical calendar, there are special days of abstinence where you have to avoid eating meat and days of fasting. So usually you reduce your food intake. Before the reforms in the 1960s in the Catholic Church, uh, December 24th was in Italian, they would call it uh, la vigilia, was a day of abstaining and fasting. 
but after they reformed this, this wasn't necessary. So most Italians today, at least where I live in Sardinia, they don't observe not eating meat. So where does this tradition of eating fish come from? So probably the tradition itself began in Southern Italy. The name doesn't though. The name is a bit of a mystery. The tradition of eating fish and seafood in general definitely has roots in Sicily, in Calabria, Campania, Puglia, so all of the coastal regions of the south of Italy where fish was more abundant. This would have been also much more affordable for these people. So eventually when Italians and Sicilians came to America, they brought a kind of form of this tradition that would take shape and become the seven fishes feast on Christmas Eve. The name itself in Italian in the south of Italy or anywhere in Italy would just simply be called La Cena della Vigilia or Il Cenone or simply La Vigilia. And the name, the Feast of the Seven Fishes probably is an invention, an American invention. Nobody really knows what it signifies. It could be that it signifies something from the Bible or maybe some people say the Seven Hills of Rome, but all of these are probably probably not true. In general, in my opinion, it's just seven sounds like a good number and more or less people eat seven varieties of fish or seafood and in some families i've heard they eat nine different varieties but either way it's still a very incredible tradition and i think it's one of the more interesting traditions italian americans carry even if it's not technically not known in italy and then what also growing up in an italian american household christmas for me was more special for its desserts and my mom would make what we would call piselle, which were kind of a wafer, not a cookie, but like a wafer that was powdered with, with powdered sugar. And many people do many different desserts, like the rainbow cookie or the Sicilian fig cookie and so many other varieties that are probably impossible to name all of them. But they were probably one of the more fascinating and, uh, let's be honest, more delicious aspects of growing up in an Italian-American household. And usually... Christmas Day or Christmas Eve, people would bring plates of these wrapped, and by the end of the day, they were completely gone. Happy to say that many of my friends and people that are my age still carry on this tradition of making these cookies. I hope you liked this Christmas episode of Searching for Italy podcast. I hope you listen to me next time. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and see you next time. Buon Natale and Arrivederci.